I'd like to bring out Mr. Nikolai Costa Waldau. Plays Jamie Lannister. Michelle Fairley. Catelyn Stark. Mr. Kit Harrington. Mr. David Benioff. Co-creator, Mr. Dan Weiss. Mr. Peter Dinklage. Lena Heaty. Mr. George R. R. Martin. Ms. Maisie Williams. And Ms. Sophie Turner. So, George, I'd like to get the evening started with you, and maybe you could tell us, and this is a story you've told a couple times, but I, I find it really fascinating, uh, about the first time that you met uh, with Dan and Dave and, and why you chose them to, with your baby. Uh, well, um, I'd written, I think, three books at that point, and uh, each one had done better than the others. At a certain point, as the books were selling well, um, I started getting interest from uh, Hollywood, from various producers and studios who were initially interested in doing it as a feature film. Um, and I met with some of those people, I had phone conversations with some people. I didn't see how it could be done as a feature film, it was simply too big. But it did get me thinking of how could it possibly be done. And I decided the only way it could be done was with someone like HBO as a series of television series, uh, each, each, each book being uh, a season. Uh, but of course, I didn't have the time to do it, but I did tell this idea to my agent, and he, uh, I was out here in Hollywood on something, and he told me he had set up a uh, meeting with these uh, guys, Benioff and Weiss, so I, I met them at the uh, Palm Restaurant. Um, I knew a little about their credits beforehand. They were both novelists. I'd read their, their own books, and uh, we had this uh, lunch at the Palm, uh, which was pretty epic. We, we got there for lunch, and we started talking, and we continued to talk, and uh, you know they had the same notion not to do it as a feature film, but to do it as a television production, and uh, we talked right through lunch. Everybody from lunch left. We were alone in the restaurant. Uh, they started resetting all the tables for dinner. Then the dinner crowd started to come <laughs> in, and we're, we were still talking, and uh, you know, I, I did, as they say, ask them a few pointed questions to determine whether they'd actually read the books, or, <laughs> and uh, they gave me the right answer, so uh, we, we shook hands, and they took the ball and ran with it, and uh, next thing I knew, we were in business with HBO. But as I understand the story, you guys, he asked you a, a specific question, and you guys guessed? He asked us, uh, should I, should I say the question? I guess I can say the question. He asks us, who is Jon Snow's mother? <laughs> and uh, we, we discussed this before. We, we gave a, an answer, a shocking answer, that uh, George never actually, at that point, he didn't actually say we, whether or not we were right or wrong, but the smile on his face, I think, was a, his smile was his tell. We knew we had passed the, the Wonka test uh, at that point, I think. And were you guys nervous? I mean, how, how long had you, had you prepped for this meeting? Yeah, we were I mean, we, we had um, read thousands of pages, and, and we got to a certain point. I remember I was midway through Storm of Swords, and I called Dan, and I said, if we could, if somehow we could get George to agree to do this, and if we could get HBO to agree to do this, and we got to a third season, we could get to this scene, which he had already read, because he's a much faster reader than I am. <laughs> I just think an audience is, is going to love it, but that means getting George to say yes and HBO to say yes and getting a pilot picked up and getting it, it all seemed pretty unlikely, but and it all depended on this meeting with George. So we were, I would say, intensely nervous. There's, uh, there's never been anything I've worked on before that I was so uh, 
excited for the possibility of it. And, and uh, you know, it was, it was pretty intimidating. It was just such a singular opportunity. We knew that it was a one-shot deal. It was one, um, one series of books like this. There would never be another series of books like this. There was one place that we could make it. There's nowhere else in the world uh, besides HBO where you could make a show like this. And uh, when, you, when you want something that badly, yeah, it does make you, uh, does make you nervous. Well, and how quickly from that point uh, forward did, did you move? We pitched uh, HBO in March. Time, pretty a few weeks after we met yeah. with George. Yeah. March of, what was it, 2006? 2006, seven yeah. years ago. God, wow. And as I understand it, you shot the, the pilot <laughs> twice. Is that correct? <laughs> Almost? <laughs> Uh, yes, I think 90% of the pilot was reshot. They, they cut my cameo. Yeah, that was they, <laughs> I, I was I was left on the cutting we've room still floor. Got, we've still got you somewhere. You're in a file. <laughs> well, George, um, I just wanted to... <laughs> Is there a chance for him to come back? Yes. Uh, well, we're gonna actually, cameo. this year. Yeah. I think we've got a Dubrovnik cameo set for George. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and this will be in, it won't be cut. It's going to be in. No, we'll okay. <laughs> you'll, you'll read for us, though, right? <laughs> oh, <sure. Yeah. laughs> uh, George, I'd like to ask a little bit about um, the, the, just thematically of the series itself. It seems like, on the surface, um, it's a story about power, the acquisition of power, political and military struggle for it. But each um, character... You know, if you dig a little uh, deeper, it seems to me like it's a story more of loss, this, the loss associated with fighting desperately for something that you think you want, and then you watch as, so instead of watching each character uh, in their ascension to the throne, it's more about watching each character and what they're losing along the way. Is that, is that accurate? Is that something that I'm just projecting onto? <laughs> <laughs> or is that an aspect of something? Well, that's, that's certainly part of it. Um, I, I mean, I think there are a number of things that the, that I'm trying to get into the books. Um, you know, there's a certain metafictional aspect, if to, I may use that pretentious word, to, uh, to writing any kind of thing. You're Tolkien and Robert E. Howard and all the great fantasists before. In some ways, this was almost my, my answer to them. Um, a lot of it is about war. Uh, a great many of the, the epic fantasies uh, from Lord of the Rings onward is about war, but to my mind, uh, a lot of it doesn't really deal honestly with the, with the consequences of war, what war does to us as a society, what war does to us as individuals, and the struggle for power in, in the same way. You know, what are we, what are we fighting for? And, and I love fantasy. I I've, I've grew up reading fantasy, but uh, I wanted to put a somewhat different spin on it. Uh, the, the whole trope of absolute good versus absolute evil, which was wonderful in the hands of J.R. Tolkien, I think became kind of cliche and, and wrote in the hands of the many Tolkien imitators who followed. Uh, I've always preferred writing about gray characters, uh, human characters who, you know, whether they are giants or elves or dwarves or, or whatever they are, they're, we're, we're, they're still human. The human heart in conflict with itself, as Faulkner says, that all of us have the capacity in us for great good and for great evil, for love, but also for hate. And I wanted to write that kind of complex characters in a fantasy, not just all the good people get together to fight the bad guy. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of amazing characters, um, I would like to talk a little bit about Tyrion. Uh, Dwarves tipped you off. <laughs> Speaking of elves. No. <laughs> I didn't want to say it, but I'm glad somebody... Unicorns, Tyrion. <laughs> <laughs> no unicorns. That's what I like about the show. Uh, Tyrion seems to be almost unflappable. I mean, it, it seems like there's really only one character that gets to him, which uh, it seems to be his father. Other than that, do, do you think that there's any other character that gets under his skin? <laughs> Aria. <laughs> Sorry, Lena was in the way. No, definitely. It's not just his father. I mean, 
Shay gets under his skin mm -hmm. quite a bit um, because he also happens to be falling in love with her. So those two go hand in hand, don't they? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> <laughs> but I feel like uh, only his father is the one that has control, more control over his destiny. So that's, that poses more of a, a problem mm -hmm. to Tyrion. The others he can easily manipulate. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what I find, yeah, even with his sister, there's a certain level of control that she might get to him I am here. briefly. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, lean, I'll lean this way. <laughs> she might get to you sometime. <laughs> she might get to both of us sometime, but most of the time we can just, yeah. Yeah, you know. By the, end of, by the end of the scene, or you know, by the end of your um, interaction with her, it seems like you're always winding up with the upper hand. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Do you ever catch yourself in real life breaking down a situation the way that Tyrion might? You know, it seems like mentally preparing for every potential move and guessing 10 steps ahead. You know, it seems like an exhausting way to live, but. Um, uh, I guess as actors, you're lucky enough to have people do that for you. <laughs> um, what airline? What? <laughs> Just take me to the airport. Uh, <laughs> latte! <laughs> so no. <laughs> Yeah. Well, Lena, speaking of your... That's American no, no. actors, though. <laughs> <laughs> huh? What? I'm saying American. that's American actors. That's a different story. Then. I learned that quickly. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever ask for a latte and it arrived on set of Game of Thrones? <laughs> yeah. What the fuck is a fucking latte? What the fuck is hell? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it's a card fighter. Uh, <laughs> oh, what the fuck is a Starbucks? Uh. Wow, I just lost the entire country of North Ireland. <laughs> Welcome back, Mr. Dingley. <laughs> <laughs> it's the greatest coffee in Belfast. <laughs> Uh, Lena, have you found, um, <laughs> um, what, what have you found has been the... to follow Pete. <laughs> Dale. It's not fair. Dan. <laughs> Thank you. I'll skip Dan. Kit, I'm, I'm a big fan of your hair. <laughs> <laughs> now, it's glorious. Thank you. And I'm wondering if that, has it always been glorious or is there a certain product? <laughs> It was glorious. It's been glorious for for a while, yeah. It's, yeah. Um, yeah. No. No. I had to. They, these two made me grow up for the show. So uh -huh. yeah, and, and it's now become a talking point in every interview. <laughs> that I know. That, that's I why. I, that's why I brought to, it up. I don't know what you're supposed to say about it. Like. I wanted to wind you up. <laughs> I wanted to. That is a part of creating that level of mayhem that I'm excited about. Uh, Nikolai also has wonderful hair. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sort of in that like Disney villain, you know, like <laughs> the prince, the prince you're rooting against. Yeah. Like he's super handsome, but <laughs> oh yes, Lena. Yes, hello. <laughs> I would go back to what has been um, the most emotionally difficult scene that you've had to play thus far? Um, I, I think this is. It's not difficult because it's exciting and I love it. I love that, you know, all the characters are super complex. But I think the stuff with, with Cersei and Tyrion is, is so deep and uh, loaded that it's always fun to play that emotional side mm -hmm. of them. I met you uh, a couple of weeks ago in line at a bathroom. Yes, you did. At a, <laughs> at a, a two year old's. Birthday party. Yeah. <laughs> That's a bit true. I, I do that weekend. Yes. <laughs> and uh, I had to go to the bathroom very badly, but not as bad as Lena. That's irrelevant, but I thought I'd let you know. Uh, 
<laughs> and I didn't recognize you at all. And I had a huge fan of the show. And we were just speaking. And I realized after I left that I, I had no idea. And I had to text these guys to find out if you were covered in tattoos and had dark hair. And they said yes. Uh, and, and I was thinking, like, that, does, but does that physical transformation, the wig and the wardrobe, does that allow you, you know, a, a, as an actor, to, to, does it help you to, to transform in, in, into Cersei? And, and almost like, like you're wearing a mask, does it, does it liberate you in a way? Well, not being blessed with glorious hair. Uh, <laughs> I'm more interested in the men's hair than I am I the ladies. <laughs> you know, it is. It's a massive part for me, getting the wig on and then getting locked into that costume, which doesn't allow for much comfort. Uh, and then kind of walking into the world that they create, it, it, it's a massive part for me of sort of becoming her and stepping into it. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I, in terms of like stepping in and stepping out, I was thinking about, um, I was thinking about Catelyn and her I mean, I was referring to a little bit loss earlier uh, about how Catelyn, as a character, seems to have lost the most or is about to lose the most. And I'm wondering how, are you able to leave that at work or does that level of, of emotional distraught come with you home? Oh, always. I'm a nervous wreck. I'm <laughs> constantly crying. <laughs> uh, no, that's part of the enjoyment of of playing her is the, the challenge. It's, it's exciting, as Lena says. You don't look at it as, as being difficult. You just, you, you wanna you know, fulfill what you've been given on the strip by David and Dan and, and Brian. So it's a delight to be given material like that, you know, to, to get engrossed in it and get lost. And it is the costume, it is the hair, it is your fellow artists, you know, the crew, everybody. And we are completely blessed with the people that we work with in the crew, is our directors, our HODs, the, everybody. It's one, the best job ever, and you know you're working with the best people. And so you're the last link in the chain, and you want to get in there and do it well. You know, but we have a lot of fun off stage as well. <laughs> See, this is the difference between <laughs> European actors and American actors. They're professionals. <laughs> <laughs> and they show up on time, and they do what they need to do, and we just bitch about it. <laughs> oh, we do that too. We show up late, and, you know. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> and they sound classier. Well, um, I'm barely here. <laughs> <laughs> They sound smart, don't they? No, they're, they're so classy. <laughs> Bullshit. All right. I guess I got to ask another one a question. Uh, Maisie, um, Arya is, is, is forced to grow up pretty fast in a, in a pretty brutal world. And I would guess that playing such a vital role in a massive series, you might feel some pressure to do the same. Or ha have you felt that pressure? And, you know, does, does that add an interesting dynamic to your performance, do you think? Yeah, I kind of feel, feel like um, I've had to grow up kind of quickly too. Doing things like this, I probably wouldn't have ever thought I'd be doing this if uh, I hadn't done Game of Thrones and stuff. And um, yeah, I don't feel like I, I would have been able to do this if I hadn't started it all. So um, I can kind of relate to Arya in that kind of sense. Um, and yeah, it kind of makes it easier to, um, to see what she's going through. And as I understand it, this was your first acting gig? Yeah, it was my second audition for anything too. <laughs> that's, that's amazing. That's amazing. <laughs> oh. um, Sophie, um, Sansa seems to make decisions from a, a very emotional place, which is <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, which is very dangerous in this in this world. And do you think as she matures that she'll sway away from this, or is it just an integral part of, of who she is? Yeah, well, um, Sansa kind of started out very innocent, very naive, and she made decisions pretty much from the heart, um, which was pretty stupid. <laughs> but I mean, I understood them as a 13-year-old being thrust into that situation. 
I feel like you would make the same decisions. So I related to her on, on that kind of ground. But I think as the seasons have gone by, uh, watching people like Tyrion and um, Littlefinger and Cersei, she's kind of learning the game now and she's learning to not trust people so much like her father did and that kind of didn't end too well. <laughs> um, so she's, she's, she's learned a lot and she's grown up and she's beginning to make decisions with her head, which is very good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I, I think it's always a, a mistake um, when people are thinking or talking about uh, actors, uh, performances by actors who are young, child, I wanna, don't want to call them child actors, but younger actors to maybe just um, relegate them to being cute or fun. And I, I think that some of the young actors, especially the ladies on the stage, uh, give performances that are as riveting and moving as anything that's on television. <laughs> now I guess we gotta get to the Kingslayer at some point. <laughs> okay. Uh, Nikolai, Jamie mentions that he is one of the few men in Westeros that, straight, that stayed faithful to one woman. Yeah. Uh, that, <laughs> that woman happens That's to true. be his sister. What's uh, that? <laughs> uh, but nevertheless, I suppose that redeems him in some, some, <laughs> well, <laughs> some very <laughs> twisted way. Uh, she has obviously not returned the favor uh, of, of being faithful. But he doesn't know that. <laughs> um, but I'm, I'm wondering, do you, do you believe that they are truly in love and that if given the chance that they could make it work. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that I really believe that he loves her mm -hmm. and he would want to be with her. And he's kind of given up everything. He's dedicated his life to this woman in many ways. Um, she might not feel the same about him, who knows, but, but I think that would be the dream. Um, the second part of your question, would that ever happen? What was that? I don't well, would you, w do you believe that if they, if they had a chance that they could make it work? <laughs> <laughs> if they had a chance together to, to, to stay together and... I think it's a little complicated. <laughs> <laughs> There's a Have you seen the show? The whole thing is complicated. <laughs> I can't I don't follow think, that. I, no, I, think, I think he knows that it's, 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 it's very tricky. I mean... It's, I just, they were very young when they started. <laughs> I don't think like, like with Santa, they, they didn't yeah. really think it through. They just started having sex and it was great. <laughs> and then she got married and he just, but and he loves continued. her. I really believe he loves her, right? You don't think she loves him? Come on, just talk. I have a kind of strange take on it. You have a strange take? I, I think she would like to be him. George, can we make that happen? <laughs> Somehow? I don't but there is magic in the world, so yeah. uh, <laughs> don't. That's a good, that's a good, that's interesting. <laughs> Kit, can you talk a little bit about um, shooting in Iceland? Um, it's beautiful, but it looks like a, like a really difficult place to shoot. Yeah. No, Are you it, miserable? <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it, it's, um, I think the first thing is that it is stunningly beautiful. Like, I get, you know, we're doing the carpet on the way and everyone's like, are you, are you jealous of the people who shoot in Croatia or Morocco? And I genuinely wouldn't give up Iceland for either of those places, even though it's, you know, minus 35. And, and, <laughs> and, and some days you, we had trouble filming because you couldn't see that far in front of your, in front of your face. Um, but it's, um, it's a wonderful place to work because it's, it gives a, it, I can't think of anywhere else that gives that landscape beyond the wall more accurately. It's more like what I imagined in my head than, than Iceland. So, no, it's wonderful. I, 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 I've kind of fallen in love with that country. But does it add a certain level of difficulty to, to some of the shooting, just in terms of I mean, just the technicality of, of having to fight in that weather? And yeah, no, I'm, I'm, it's, 
it's kind of like, I always think it's like guerrilla filmmaking a bit. It's like you have to set up so quickly because you have so little daylight and you have to work at such a rapid pace because you've got so little time to shoot everything. Um, that it's, yeah, it's not, it's not exactly made for film work, Iceland, but <laughs> you get, when you get the, what I think is the, some of the most beautiful scenery in the show, it's incredible. But yeah, the, the actual, the physicality of it as well, like doing, I think the hardest thing I've ever done on this show was doing the fight with Corin Harfand at the end of season two, because we, 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 you know, we choreographed this fight that was quite sort of, that flowed and was quite eloquent. And then, um, and then we got out to location and the snow was, you know, came up to about there. And if you've ever tried running through snow or sand, it's very difficult. So doing a, a fight scene in that, in that kind of conditions was, was, was really tough and, and kind of quite emotionally draining in, in some ways. So I, I, I really loved that scene, but it was, wasn't easy. It wasn't easy to film. Right. And, and, and David and Dan, can you talk a little bit about about the difficulties in shooting, just a little bit about the process of how you have three units working in unison. Well, one thing I would just add to what Kit said, he's, he's being modest, but he, he's very, very good at the stunt work. And, and the reason we're able to shoot that fight with Corin Hafiand in five hours of daylight, which is what we had that day, was because Kit knew the fight so well. And we're very lucky that, you know, Kit and Nikolai both actually, the, the sword fight with um, uh, Jamie and Ned Stark in season one, which is, you know, still one of my favorite fights in the show. and, and uh, and Nikolai just picks that stuff up so fast. And then, you know, I don't know if you remember this, but he jumped on the horse and galloped off. Yeah, yeah. I can and the horse almost, you almost got decapitated by the <laughs> sign post <laughs> against the wall. And he did this kind of incredible duck at the last second. Otherwise, that beautiful face would have been squashed. And <laughs> it was so good. And it stayed in the show because it just looked good. It looked like a, you know, a real guy ducking. But um, sorry, what was your question? <laughs> real guy. <laughs> Oh, Let's talk about how, how beautiful he is. He's a real guy. Some more. <laughs> I feel like that's what the whole panel's been yeah. about so far. <laughs> Kit and Nikolai and how beautiful they are. Uh, no, just about the, the three units that you guys... We've, we've oh. got two geniuses sitting over there in the third row or something, Bernie Caulfield and Chris Newman, who are kind of... Yeah. <laughs> They're kind of the real producers. You know, we're... we're <laughs> Kind of not. We're kind of the writers <laughs> who say, "Wouldn't it be cool if we could do this?" And then they're actually the ones who have to do it all and produ <laughs> actually produce things. And, and the schedule. Chris's office is is uh, right down the hall from ours. And so every night when we're leaving the office in pre-production, we walk by this massive uh, wall board, on, you know, with a schedule. It's a giant kind of flowchart schedule, and it's got the three units in all the different locations. This past year, we shot in five different countries, and. It's the most terrifying thing. I don't look at it. Yeah, you don't want to. <laughs> you don't want to look at it. It just seems terrifying. impossible. And every time something bad happens, like weather, if we lose a day because of weather, if an actor gets injured, if um, anything else happens, the schedule has to change. And it's like this. It's the most uh, challenging Tetris puzzle, you know. And somehow Chris, Chris has it all in his brain, mm -hmm. but um, we don't know how we, we make him. It. We make him wear a helmet. <laughs> <laughs> God forbid, gets a knock to the head. So, but you guys directed an episode this did, this upcoming yes, yes, season. Yes, third okay, one. and how, so how many countries did you? We did shot you in, four, in yeah. all of them. Yeah, we shot in. We had a couple days in Morocco, a day in Croatia, and uh, a day in Iceland, and the usual Belfast stuff. Wow. Wow. So, you, and so you'll have, and you cross board how many at a time then? How many episodes? Yes. The whole season. I yeah. Mean, last, the entire the season. Season is three. The first scene we shot was from the tenth and yeah. final episode. So the entire season is cross-boarded. Um, uh, we have two units shooting virtually every day. Not, not first and second unit, but two first units with you know, uh, directors, two different episodes shooting every day. And for a couple of weeks last season, we had three units shooting every day, three directors from three episodes, often in two different countries. Yeah, I believe, I'm thinking of the first season, there were a couple days where we had four units. I think we might have, yeah. I remember asking where something was, and somebody said, that he's, with, he's with D unit. <laughs> <laughs> What's D unit? <laughs> where is D-Unit? I think it was not even where we had one until uh, I found out they were shooting something. <laughs> well, among uh, critical praise for Game of Thrones, Newsday called it the best show on television, while the Los Angeles Times termed the series a cinematic feast and masterful. And the New York so Times called it a piece of shit. <laughs> <laughs> what do they know? <laughs> <laughs> they didn't quite say that. What they 
<laughs> what they actually said, what they actually said is that no woman would ever want to watch it. That's why we have an entirely male audience. Not true. <laughs> uh. <laughs> I didn't actually read it. I made Dan read it. <laughs> That's what he told me. That was my summary. <laughs> I, do, I do coverage on reviews. <laughs> Uh, well, we have a couple of questions from, uh, from Twitter, from the Twitterverse, and I wanted to ask some of these. Uh, this comes from Gina Wolf at Wolf G. Uh, who is the funniest on set? Mm. I'm looking at you. Um, <laughs> Conleth Hill, mm -hmm. the, the, or, or Arvaris. The man to do a scene with him is it's nearly impossible <laughs> <laughs> without just peeing your pants. <laughs> Not from laughing, but just peeing your pants. <laughs> <laughs> he has this thing he does where you can just, just pee your pants. No. <laughs> oh yeah, definitely trauma. <clears throat> and I barely have any scenes with him, so it's so easy. <laughs> I would say yeah. Gwendolyn Christie is also yeah. Yeah. a very, Gwen. very funny person. Gwendolyn Christie. Yeah. Yeah. But I think I went four months, season one, without ever seeing um, Sean Bean smile. And then <laughs> one day on set in Malta, I look over and I hear laughter. And it's, it's kind of strange. I'd never heard this particular. I look over and there's Sean Bean laughing. And that was odd. And then, and then he's really <laughs> laughing. And it was, it was all Conleth. Conleth was just cracking him up. And I'd never seen anyone do that before. Yeah, Conleth yeah. is. I think Conleth <laughs> gets a real kick about ah. making you laugh. He's evil. It's a real game. Yeah. <laughs> I often stare at a vase when I'm in the <laughs> <laughs> I stare I'm at like, a spar head. It's a character head. choice, because yeah. I can't look at you. Yeah. And he never cracks. You can do no. anything, and he won't. No, he I remember there was one scene, Peter, uh, where... Well, that's because you guys aren't funny. He's the funny one. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> there was a scene where he had Peter, he was cracking Peter up just with the way he said, a shy. And he was saying... <laughs> a shy. <laughs> 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 you, you couldn't do your takes because of the way he was saying <laughs> What's the name we the um, by Archibald Chamalatiche or whatever that book was, that scene? God. The mud game. Shava la Shamalama ding dong. <laughs> Do you find people think you're British in real life? Um uh, No fucking way. <laughs> I'm from Jersey, man. No way. <laughs> no. <laughs> I thought there was something else coming, but he's done. All right, we're moving on. No. Uh, this, this, is, uh, uh, this is a question from uh, Shauna at Shauna, a.k.a. Shauna, 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 Shauna. Uh, oh, you know what? <laughs> this could be a good question um, for Sophie. Uh, are the dire wolves real wolves? <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes, the dire wolves in season one were real um, because I took mine home. <laughs> uh, <laughs> thank you, George. <laughs> Please. Um, <laughs> yeah, the dire wolves are real, and mine was probably the worst trained dog on set. <laughs> um, but uh, the rest of them were really good. I mean, the trainers were fantastic. Um, and then I think in season two, they just enhanced them, or was it total CGI? They're wolves. Uh, they're, we shoot them as, they're, they're real wolves, trained wolves that are shot here uh, as visual effects uh, elements and then scaled up by about 50%, which I think is about the maximum you can you can realistically scale an animal up without it starting to look fake because we've got, the, we've got them to the point where they're supposed to be the size of like maybe almost the size of a small pony. And, uh, and, and, and we looked into doing CG at the time. It, it just seemed like it was gonna be prohibitively expensive to do it that way. So we, uh, we do them real wolves shot separately and then inserted with visual effects into the And scene. those are real dragons too. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> those we breed. <laughs> Uh, this is a, a question for everybody. Uh, if you weren't playing your character, who would you pl who would you like to play, male or female, and why? Maybe we'll start with Nikolai. <laughs> oh, that's a good question. I would like to play. Mm. 
It's that was creepy. Well, we're skipping creepy. you. Creepy. Maisie. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, uh, Tyrion Lannister. Yeah. <laughs> and not because I think I could do it better, but <laughs> oh, wait, 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 <laughs> wait. <laughs> that's true. No, it's a, it's, a, it's a fantastic character. That's why. Okay, just keep the quiet. It's not, it's not uncomfortable at all. <laughs> that's why it's a new reality show. <laughs> Who can play Tyrion? Michelle. Uh, oh me. Oh, yeah. Um, I think I would love to go back in time and play Arya, actually. Yeah, I would. I'd, l I'd love that character. I think she's amazing. And hands down to, to Maisie. And um, she's an amazing character. Her strength and her vulnerability is incredibly appealing. And just her braveness. Yeah. I think this is probably because of the way Jerome Flynn plays him. But I love Bronn. He's got the best one-liners, um, <laughs> and he's just and he's just a. I find him a brilliant character in the books, the one that George, you know, the character George wrote. But also, the way Jerome plays him, I think, is amazing. Benny Off, why not? What's <laughs> from you, bro? Oh, Call Drogo, definitely. <laughs> 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 Now, you recently told me a story about a... a, a uh, Chris. <laughs> you had a, you had a run-in. Yeah, yeah. He's uh, strong. He mm. is. He's not just Hollywood. That's not just, you know, look strong. Uh, that's real strength, which I found out, unfortunately, to my dismay. Uh, <laughs> we brought him back in season two for, for one scene, and, and, uh, and so mostly just so we could hang out with him in Belfast, because we love Momoa. And so after his scene with Amelia, we all went out for dinner, uh, Dan and, and Amelia and Jason and I, and, and uh, he was talking about working out, doing his Conan workout or something. <laughs> and I have been drinking quite a bit. It's like that story about the mouse in the bar room who starts drinking the, you know, the beer taps open, he starts lapping up the beer puddle and says, now where's that damn cat? So I was, <laughs> I was, the, I was the drunk mouse. And uh, <laughs> I said, Momoa, you ever play Mercy? I can't mercy. No, I've got it. <laughs> yeah. And he said, uh, yeah. <laughs> and I just, for whatever reason, I had it in my head that I really thought I was going to win. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't. <laughs> I didn't. And I was no, so didn't. drunk and stubborn that I refused to say mercy, even though he was um, destroying me until Amelia started, you know, Screaming. Why after, why after that you decided to then play the slap game? And then I played the slap <laughs> that was the That was the mystifying move to me. Also, also didn't win. Seemed like possibly more damaging than, than <laughs> of sheer tendon, tendon damage. And two, two days later, the next day, my hands were pretty swollen, but you know, I thought it, it'll go down, I'll keep icing them. And the day after that, they were even more swollen. <laughs> and then I flew back to LA. We were done, and I flew back, and uh, I come home to try to hug my wife, but I can't really touch her. <laughs> and she looked at me, and she said, we're going to Cedar sinai right now. And, and uh, yeah, he had squished my hand. That's what the doctor, in the emergency room, the doctor actually said, your hand was squished. Matthew Weiner would never do that, right? <laughs> <laughs> too smart. He's too smart for that. He's too smart for that. We, I, I've arm wrestled him. All right. Who won? And he's, he beat the shit out of me. He's tougher than you think. He was a wrestler. Yeah. He was a wrestler, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Dan? Who, who would I play? I would save the show by absolutely refusing to play any character <laughs> whatsoever. I would, there's nothing, no good could come of that. I promise you. All right, thanks for playing the game. <laughs> Moving on. Um, Mr. Dinklage. Probably Don Draper. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit, wrong show. <laughs> um, well, if Mr. Benioff is playing Carl Drago, I'll play Daenerys Targaryen. <laughs> <laughs> Picture, picture it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <It's hot>. <laughs> 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 Amelia's 
going to watch that with the like just dead face. <laughs> <laughs> Lena, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't give Cersei up. Oh. I wouldn't. <laughs> Come on. Fucking love it. <laughs> George. George, what do you think? Well, I, I do play all the characters, of course. <laughs> when I write that, all of them. <laughs> one after another. But if they actually had to film me, I guess the only one that I could play would be, uh, would be Samuel Tarley. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe Hot Pie. <laughs> Hot Pie. <laughs> I met him last night. He's great. <laughs> Maybe. Um, I really like Arya, uh, but it'd be kind of cool to wear nice clothes and have <laughs> nice hair and stuff. So I think Daenerys kind of captures a lot of that and still gets to have fun, ride horses and stuff. So and have the nice hair and clothes. <laughs> so yeah, Daenerys. <laughs> I guess it's me now. Um, I would love to play Joffrey. <laughs> <laughs> because I, you know, you can only be beat up so often. You want to beat someone else up. Um, so yeah, I guess that would be pretty fun. Yeah. <laughs> well, George, when, uh, just speaking to your process a little bit, um, as you're writing now, do you hear the actors' voices, or do you still continue to hear the voices of the characters that you originally imagined? I, I, I don't. I still hear, you know, I started writing this in 1991, so I think it was like 2007 when I met uh, Dan and David, so I had a 16-year head start on living with these uh, characters, and they got pretty hardwired into my brain. So as, as great as our cast is, when I'm alone with a computer, it's, it's still the characters that I've been with since 1991 that, uh, that I see and, uh, and hear. And do you, uh, obviously we all become emotionally uh, invested in, in the characters, which makes it that much more difficult when we see them melted with molten gold <laughs> <laughs> or their, uh, their heads removed from their bodies or being unseen from the nave to the chops. Uh, I'm wondering if, I'm wondering if you develop, um, if you develop an emotional rapport with the characters, and does that, especially seeing them as being portrayed and brought to life, does that affect your writing, or the plans that you may have for them? Well, I think it had the potential to do that, which I don't necessarily know would be a good thing. But fortunately, I am so far ahead of the of the series. Like uh, last night at the uh, at the party. I find my, found myself at one point talking to three very nice actors who were very pleasant and I was having a great time uh, talking with them and drinking with them and then I suddenly realized that I had killed all three of them <laughs> at various <laughs> points in the series and that these would all shortly be unemployed actors. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> and I had a moment of horrible guilt. Uh, <laughs> but. You know, it's, it's already done, but, uh, and, and it was particularly sad when, when one of them said, please don't kill my character, and you know, she, she's already dead, but. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, so it's, it's probably just as well that I don't know these people uh, when we're actually doing it, because when, they, when the, I meet the actors and the actresses, and they're, they're such tremendously nice people, and it's, it's then hard to, them. David and Dan don't seem to have this problem though because I, <laughs> I've noticed as bloodthirsty as I am in killing all of these characters, David and Dan are killing some characters who are still alive in the books. <laughs> so their, their body count is actually ahead of mine when, when they say no one is safe in the series. That's literally true. There are characters who are in book five and who are going to be in book six who are dead on the TV <laughs> show. <laughs> yeah, so what's that process like when you guys decide to <laughs> change what Mr. Martin has written. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, we, we, need to, we need to make room, you know. I mean, it's just that the, it's a huge cast, and sometimes you just need to, need to clear some people out Plans. of the way. Yeah, it's like a, 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 pur, a culling, a purge, a culling. Like there are too many deer in the forest, you know. Uh, no, I, I think that we, we obviously, we would love George's books uh, more than 
in many ways any books we've ever read. Otherwise, we wouldn't have devoted uh, uh, every waking and most sleeping moments of our, our lives to them. Um, and in the process of adapting the show, however, uh, as complex as the show is allowed to be, as com you know, compared to a to a, a feature film or a <coughs> normal television show, it's still ten hours seems like a lot. But when you have a world like the world George has has built, it, you start to realize how quickly that story real estate gets gets taken up. And uh, there there have been places where we we did just have to kind of uh, clear out space. Um, to, to make room to, for all these guys who we love so much and we are so invested in uh, to do them justice because uh, if there are too many balls in the air, it just you, at a certain point I think that an audience can, can really keep in their head at once and remain invested with at once. So it really is, it's, a, it's kind of a juggling act to get right up to that line uh, of like maximum complexity but not go over it and start to lose people. And do you guys find that you're generally on the same page? Yeah, I mean sometimes our hands are tied. Sometimes an actor will say, you know, I, I'm, I'm an actor that we don't actually uh, have a long-term contract with will say, I can only give you, you know, two days in July and th maybe a couple days in October because I'm doing these movies. And we say, well, great, well, yeah, great, so give us a couple days in July and then they get there and we kill them. And that, <laughs> that makes it easier. <laughs> We never liked you anyway. <laughs> it happened. And do you do you bring that to George, or George, do you trust them? Uh, I tr trust them. Uh, I, I do. I do. <laughs> and I know it's a useful tool to keep the actors from like asking for raises. And, uh, <laughs> so I've been I've been on the other side of it. Um, you know, sure. In a perfect world, I would I would like more hours um, each year. I would like more money. So you know, each episode had the budget of a Peter Jackson film. But uh, <laughs> I don't think this is very likely. And uh, given the realities of the production, um, wow. it's incredible that uh, what they do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, well, that actually brings me to uh, my next question. Um, Taking into account that you know you guys are, uh, I believe, arbiters of quality programming, and it leads me to a question I'm sure everybody here is thinking: Despite all of the critical and popular success, why is it that you believe that my show has never been nominated for an Emmy? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> and if anybody else wants to jump in, I'm no. I'm all ears because I'm confused. No, no, it seems aggressive. You don't have any swords. No got, swords. We have very few dragons. <laughs> I just feel like you're missing you're missing some elements. I think it's it's the wire of comedy. I honestly don't get it. You no, know this because I you don't get the show. You don't get my. Oh, no, no. <laughs> it makes no I, sense. I, I, I don't get, now I'm, you know. I've watched every episode yeah. of the damn show. Yeah. I don't get why it's not no. nominated for awards. It's it's and it is. It's mind boggling. <laughs> and just you know, Rob is very nice. When when Kate was injured uh, last year and and uh, was recuperating for nine months or something was it? Um, how long were you? Just, I'm still, I'm still recouping. <laughs> and was, but was truly was bedridden for a while, and and, uh, and we sent you several seasons. Rob sent you all these seasons. So of the, the entire, entire, the entire box. Yes. Okay. I mean, we're we're obsessed with it. I think mm -hmm. it's it's. Uh, I don't think I've watched more hours of any show or more half hours, maybe except for. It was just a joke, Benny. Off. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really want to know the answer. It's not about. <laughs> they didn't come here to see me. <laughs> Uh, let's th let's take another. But I appreciate it's that. It's a crime. It's a crime. It is a crime. Yeah. By the way, <laughs> <laughs> if I wasn't clear about that, it's a, it's a fucking crime. <laughs> All right, moving on. Uh, this is a, a, again from the Twitterverse. If you weren't, um, sorry, who would you like to see on the Iron Throne, and why? Question for everyone. We'll start with the other. Uh -huh. Sorry. Okay. Um, I'd probably like to see my pals. Um, <laughs> uh, Rob, probably, on the Iron Throne, because he, um, he has the right intentions, but also, you know, he's very good at the politics, I think, him and Catelyn. Um, but, you know, they have a good heart, and they, they'd be ruling for, for good and for the right reasons. 
whereas, uh, I mean, it's arguable the others are doing it for the dosh. Um, so yeah, definitely Rob. Plus he's like, he's really nice and he's my brother, so. <laughs> I'm a little biased. Uh, yeah, it'd be cool to see a Stark on the throne. I don't know who, Boom. but I think they kind of. <laughs> <laughs> Arya's just trying to get home. She never really... <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I think they're uh, loyal and it's, it's, it kind of turns out that if you're loyal, you kind of die. So it'd be cool <laughs> if maybe, yeah, Stark got to the throne in the end. But, you know, you know, so... I know who's going to be on the throne at the end. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I better not say. <laughs> <laughs> But it'll, it'll, uh, there'll be a few people sitting on it before the end, so. Hey. Oh, Ooh. hello. <laughs> uh, you just gave me the look of death, George. Uh. <laughs> a little scared. Um, I put Tyrion on it, because I think Westeros would be wicked. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, first I'd get, I'd bring in a design team. <laughs> To get rid of the the, car, the swords, <laughs> I get some plush pillows <laughs> and just make it a bit softer because anybody sitting on that will inherently be aggressive because they're being poked in the ass by all the eyes. <laughs> if you sit on our, I don't know how Jack does it. Every time I sit on it, he knows hmm. where to sit. He knows where to sit. I don't know he where avoids. to sit. <laughs> um, I, I think Tyrion would be okay with it. Uh, George? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I, I hear, I hear. <laughs> George has told us the answer. Oh, all right. Really? <laughs> I'll go with Tyrion. Why? I, think he, I genuinely think he's the only person who talks sense in the entire thing. <laughs> 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 Thank you. <laughs> Everyone else talks nonsense, and Tyrion talks sense. Yeah. So, <laughs> everybody talks nonsense. What about Very Bron? eloquently what about and really well. <laughs> <laughs> <I said Bron>. <laughs> <laughs> Michelle? Oh, well, I would have said Tyrion as well, but too many people have already said that. <laughs> so, I think I agree with Sophie and pick Rob, actually. Yeah, mm. because in some selfish way, my ass would be on that throne, too. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Uh, I, I think, um, I don't think that monarchy really works for Westeros. <laughs> I think we should just get rid of all those wannabe cats. Oh, please. <laughs> <laughs> but Tyrion would, would do that, wouldn't you? You know, I was never picked for the dodgeball team. <laughs> <laughs> this feels great. <laughs> <laughs> but I think he'd blow it within a week. You know, <coughs> something would happen. Oh, behave. Uh, yeah. Nice. Right? Yeah, you, yeah, you see, you got it. Right on. All right. Here we go. Uh, this is another uh, question from the Twitterverse for everybody. Tell us your best fan encounter. <laughs> I was sat, um, I, we were, went to a restaurant and we just sat at the bar waiting for our table. And um, uh, I ordered a drink and the guy was like, oh, hey. I was like, hi, and then he went really shy and picked up a box and walked away. And uh, well, it might have just been kind of weird, but I think he might have recognized me and thought he knew me. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, like now I say it out loud, maybe it was just a bit weird. <laughs> <laughs> Sophie? I got a um, weird fan mail once. <laughs> <laughs> Riveting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just the ones. Just the ones. <laughs> this, this girl had um, dressed up in like period costume. She'd obviously sort of made herself. It was quite good. Um, but she'd done like a photo shoot with her friend, like 
But she just blacked out her friend's face. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, don't look at her. Don't look at her. Look at me. Look at her. Like five photos with her friend's face blacked out. <laughs> Hissing myself. I got some fan mail recently. Um, uh, it was uh, a photograph, and uh, it must have been from judging by the, the fashion and the sort of you know look of the picture. It was from 1970, <laughs> and uh, in the picture it was a group of elderly men, um, all holding harmonicas. <laughs> <laughs> and in the middle, and one has like a sailor cap, <laughs> and there's the manager on the side in a tuxedo, Ricardo Montalban, white tuxedo. And in the middle, there's a gentleman who is, shares my condition. He is a, a dwarf, and uh, he has, uh, he's just sitting there smiling without a harmonica, <laughs> but with, like astroturf pants. <laughs> <laughs> and a big like uh, like a dandy a dandy ascot. <laughs> and he's <laughs> <laughs> And I'm like, well that's an interesting picture. And then I read the attached letter and it's typed. So that's a little creepy, but. Um, <laughs> and it says, I, my father was a photographer, and I was going through his old photographs, and I came across this one. So I thought I would send it, <laughs> and realized it could be in the center, it could be no one else but the Game of Thrones Peter Dinklage. <laughs> So if you do the math, <laughs> I'm either immortal <laughs> or, which some of us are, no, um, or <laughs> I was one when this picture was taken. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, so my point is, I guess, all the advances my, my people have <laughs> Done through the show helping. You'll still get a photograph in the mail thinking you were part of a harmonica band <laughs> in 1970. <laughs> I, I, I framed it and put it in my bathroom. <laughs> so every time I'm taking a pee, <laughs> boys. <laughs> <laughs> All different, like big harmonicas, little ones. <laughs> <laughs> Lena, would you like that to follow no, that? I don't want to follow that. <laughs> uh, I, I really don't. Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, uh, you guys have, uh, Dan and David, you've, you've talked about season three as the season that you, you were most excited about. Can you tell us why? <clears throat> well, I think that uh, we fell in love with George's books. We fell in love with so there's so many devastatingly great set pieces and scenes in George's books, and it just there was such a uh, across the series, of course. But the, I would say that the predominance uh, of the scenes that really just made us say "Holy shit," and we knew would make other people say "Holy shit" if they saw them properly done uh, on television. Uh, more came from the third book. Uh, which actually will span over the third and fourth seasons, it turns out. But but uh, season three was really the one that, that we focused on. Is like this is the place, this is the place we need to get. Yeah, it's it, the longer you work in this business, you know, you start to um, you start to be more able to see the carpentry. You know, you can see the seams, you can see where things are going, and and, and um, it's harder to surprise you, I guess, as a reader. And there there are a few scenes in, in Storm of Swords for, that are so devastating that. I didn't see them coming, and, and when I went back and reread them, the clues are there. It's not the kind of, it's not a, you know, the random surprise where you couldn't see it coming because no one could have seen the lawyer walking into the empty elevator shaft because, you know, that, that <laughs> LA Law <laughs> reference there. Uh, 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 you know, they're, they're, they're beautifully set up, but somehow George hid them from, from you, and, and uh, so that's, you know, what we're trying to emulate with season three, and, and uh, you know. God knows if we've succeeded, but that was that was yeah that was the book we've always prayed we'd get to. 
And, and where is the order at this point from HBO? I mean, obviously there's enough material to make a show for the next decade. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that the plan? We, we don't have, um, there's no order. We're, we're still waiting for a green light on season four. The executives are here. <laughs> they're here tonight. They're sitting somewhere out there. And right now they're sweating. <laughs> because we talked about that riot thing earlier. <laughs> I'm just putting it out there. I won't be responsible for what happens. Um, <clears throat> this is uh, from uh, at Freya 300. What are the most difficult scenes to shoot? Technically, from a technical standpoint, CGI, et cetera. Oh, for us? Uh, yes. Well, anything with the dragons is, is mm -hmm. tricky because <laughs> they're, not, they're not there. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I think, but, but last year, the Blackwater episode, not, not a scene in particular, but the whole episode, that was a, a monster. Um, partly because it was one giant battle, and partly it was all shot at night, and nights in Belfast, as Peter well knows, because he was standing out there in the mud. Uh, they're not pleasant, you know, so it was, uh, it was tough on the crew, tough on the cast, tough on everybody, but um, Neil Marshall did an insane job, and the great thing about Neil was, um, Neil Marshall, who, who directed that episode, uh, Neil came on a week before we started, I think he had one week of prep because um, there, there was a, a personal emergency, and so a director fell out, and, and we, we were in crisis mode looking for a director. Dan and I are both fans of his movie, The Descent, um, and literally, he, he uh, <laughs> Bernie called him and said, um, Neil, you know, we, we want you to come do this for us. Uh, it starts shooting in, I think it was nine days, eight days. Bernie's out there somewhere. Uh, could we get you to come to us on Monday? This was a Friday. Could you come over on Monday? And there's kind of a pause. He says, oh, you know, okay, so Monday afternoon. I kind of need you to come Monday. There's a <laughs> 545 flight gets into <laughs> And he came, and, and the incredible thing about Neil is, is everyone else was a little bit panicked about this episode because it was so big, and, and we were trying to cut things out and figure out how we could possibly shoot everything in the time we had. And Neil kept saying, well, what if we added this shot of a guy's head? What if a giant rock fell from the top of the wall and this guy's skull just exploded everywhere? And we thought, oh, that sounds great, but you're not going to have time today. He said, oh, no, no, I think we can do it. And he just kept adding beats and beats and beats. And, uh, he was a monster. <laughs> yeah. he, he just, he, he was uh, our hero. So that was, that whole episode, Blackwater, uh, that was the biggest challenge. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I, I can imagine it. And, and how much of that on set was, was green screen for you, for you guys as, as actors? A fair amount, I would I guess. Um, nothing. I mean, <laughs> that's... I guess that's, incorrectly. You no. Know, I mean, obviously, the... the uh, explosion and the reaction to the, you know, all of that is you gotta fake, I mean, not fake, you know, just you're going like this and there's just <laughs> <laughs> a grip going with the light. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, uh, so but everything else. So you're complaining about acting. What? You're complaining about acting. See, this is the American thing. <laughs> This is the American thing. He called it, we had to fake it. <laughs> you know, we had to fake it. seeing the explosion. Oh, that was weird. We had to act. I was like, where's the explosion? <laughs> Not there. <laughs> but, um, no, it was, it was great. I mean, the great, one of the many things, great things I love about this show is it really working in those environments, you know, that breath that you see coming out of our mouths, is, it's, it's really that cold, and, you know, Kit can speak more of that stuff. You know, it's, it really adds to being in the moment, because um, it's, yeah, yeah. Um, and when it finally stops raining, the guy with the hose goes, sorry, guys. <laughs> <laughs> you're like, oh, God, right, you have to match it. So. <laughs> That's almost a cruel joke. You're like, oh, finally, <laughs> fuck. <laughs> Thankfully, it rains a lot in Belfast. But... <laughs> wow, I'm shitting on Belfast. I so don't know. <laughs> it's the greatest place in the world. <laughs> Truly. Sounds like it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's not. No. <laughs> oh my God. 
We should shoot this in Burbank. <laughs> Maisie, can you talk a little bit about um, <laughs> uh, a little bit of uh, the training that you had to do for the uh, sport swordsmanship? Um, before I started uh, acting and stuff, uh, I always enjoyed dancing and things. And um, it's described in the books uh, and the series as a water dance. So uh, before we started everything, I kind of thought maybe my dance background would help with it. Um, and it did, so uh, it was kind of like a dance, but you've got a stick in your hand. Um, yeah, and I, I picked it up quite quickly, uh, and I really enjoyed it, and it was lovely working with the stunt guys, and they were always uh, made sure you're okay, and um, anything you were struggling with, they'd change, or you know, uh, show you how to do it easier. Um, but yeah, I, uh, I really enjoyed it, and uh, then after kind of learning the routine or whatever, it was kind of just then making it look like you were really trying to hit their head instead of meeting the sword or things like that, and um, putting more effort into different parts, and yeah, kind of like acting it, I guess. <laughs> Um, but yeah, uh, it's, I don't know, people always say, like, are you a good sword fighter? But I don't know if I'd stand much of a chance against, I mean, I put up a good fight, but <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if, uh, um, I don't know if I can actually sort of like combat fight, because it's kind of just routines and stuff. But um, yeah, I'll try. <laughs> <laughs> Will we find out? The, the incredible thing about, about Maisie is that they were teaching her the stunt routine, and she said, well, I've got to learn how to do it left-handed. And he said, why? And she said, because Arya is left-handed in the books. <laughs> so, so she went and... Uh, when, when I didn't know much about it all, I was looking on the internet, and um, people uh, were getting funny about Cass not having the right hair color or this or that. And then Mum um, had told me uh, after reading the books that Arya was left-handed. And I thought because I hadn't done sword fighting before, if you just learn it in the other hand, then maybe be easier. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it was good. And yeah, I'm still doing it, so. <laughs> uh, and, and Kit, what, what was the training like for you? How intensive was it? It's quite intensive. I mean, it, I, I, I really love the fight stuff. I kind of, it's my, some of my favorite stuff to do. So it's, a, it's quite enjoyable, actually. I mean, it's like for your job, you get to kind of go and fight with swords. It's not, it's not exactly hard. It's kind of, <laughs> I don't know, it is, it is. But um, I don't know, it, it's, you have to put, yeah, you, you, we've got great stunt guys on this show who um, very care a lot about your safety and also very good at teaching you how to, you know, make it look like you really know how to hold a sword. So we, we do kind of, we do a bit of training when we, when we can, I guess. Just a bit? Yeah, just, just a bit. When we, you know, we put in the time after hours. When, like in Iceland, we'd come home from filming and, and we'd practice the sword fight every evening until we got it right. And you just keep doing that. How long are your days? Generally. In Belfast, they can be very long. In, um, in you know, you, you, do, you go until you finish, really. Um, and, but in, in Iceland, <laughs> you've only got a, sh a short amount of time daylight. So you, you, you work from, it gets light at, you get onto set about eight, and then it gets light at 10, and then it gets dark at four. And then you go home and you have a few drinks and, and <laughs> learn, learn how to sword fight. <laughs> <laughs> It's like live entertainment, really well. you get to kick back and with a beer and watch Kit get hit with a stick. <laughs> <laughs> actually did do that. <laughs> and Nikolai, do you have a, a similar experience with that? I mean, it seems like you guys are pretty good with yeah. swords. It's hard oh. to believe that you're just getting drunk and, lear <laughs> and learning after work. I know. Um, <laughs> it is hard to believe. No, we have, it's the stunt guys. They're just brilliant, really. I mean, it's like learning a dance. That's what you do. So. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, another question from the Twitterverse. Uh, who reads the books? 
I know you guys have answered this a lot, but I think it's, um, I think it's really interesting to people just in terms of, of knowing how the story is unfolding, where your character is headed. Um, how many of you guys actually read the books? Sophie, do you, do you read the books? Um, I read the books season by season, but my chapters, sorry guys. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> because, well, A, the books are really complicated. I can only just about manage the TV series. <laughs> They're amazing, but complicated. Um, um, so I just kind of know my storyline, but I don't want to, you know, think my storyline is going off in one direction, and then because it's just an adaptation, goes off in a completely different one. So um, season by season, only my chapters. So it's like, you know, not too many pages either. <laughs> <laughs> um, my mum and stepdad have both read the books and they've told me roughly what happens to Arya, um, not every single uh, encounter along the way, um, uh, because I know that things change, like I didn't meet Tywin really in the books and then that kind of came up in the scripts, um, which was great, and then things like Weasel Soup didn't happen. Um, but yeah, I guess I know roughly what happens to her, so then you just uh, wait till the scripts come and then see what you're actually uh, going to be doing. And then when all this finishes, I do really want to read them, but I'm kind of confused a bit at the moment, so. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, but I do really want to read them, so. I've read them. <laughs> <laughs> This is awkward, because I'm sitting next to George. But, um, I haven't read them. Uh, I speak to a lot of people about them, because seemingly a lot of people have. <laughs> and uh, it, it's interesting to get different takes on characters. And then, of course, we have the words from David and Dan. So I just, I let it unfold. I kind of like to be surprised. But I'm scared I'm now going to die. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, time to kill another Lannister. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I um, with all apologies to George and just in such mm, I'm so in awe of this man, um, <laughs> but uh, I, I don't want to know what happens to me down the road. I'm terrified, and I don't want to play any sort of ending uh, when I'm doing this show. And I just live and breathe this show, and I, I, I uh, I'm so embarrassed when I have to run, you fucker. Yeah. Why do <laughs> you do you know how often we get asked this question? Yeah. And I go, hold on, what? Then I just say, walk away. Um, <coughs> it's, the people it's funny want to know. To, it's That's funny the gig. Though, I'm also going to ask who you're dating at some point. Yeah. <laughs> um, I also, I, I can't subtract the show from the book. So, I, I, you know, I'm that guy who has a really hard time reading the book after he sees the movie. Because I'll just, I'll just picture Stephen Dorff, you know? Um, <laughs> Okay, uh, <laughs> sorry. If you could let me know what movie Steven Dorff did that was based on a book. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm just interested in why you thought of Steven Dorff. <laughs> it's just the first actor that came to my head. <laughs> and he's, he comes to my head all the time. <laughs> now we're getting somewhere. Yeah. Oh, now we're getting know, somewhere. I just would picture my friends on the show, and uh, I, I will. I'm going to read them when we're after my character now gets killed. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I've I've read the first four, not the latest one. Uh, All right. <laughs> <laughs> um, I couldn't help myself when I got the part. I and you know it's based on books. I I went. I read them very quickly actually, because I, I, I just wanted to know what happened to my character and I then got way too ahead of myself and had to you know, reel it back in. Um, yeah, so I have read them, yeah. 
Yeah, I read per season. Yeah. <laughs> and I must admit, I did take a leaf out of Sophie's book as well. <laughs> like, <laughs> look for the title of your character. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, fill in the dots in between. Well, like with Maisie, my mum read the book. <laughs> <laughs> She did a really good summary, so. <laughs> uh, Dan and David, can you talk a little bit about um, which characters that you found the most I'm challenging? I'm gonna die. <laughs> <laughs> suddenly I'm sweating. I know. Uh. Sleep the chair. <laughs> Uh, which characters did you find the most challenging to cast, and why? Um, Arya. Yeah, Arya. I would say we probably saw more, more people for, for Arya and Daenerys than, than any other characters. I mean, we must have seen, how many, we must have seen 300 Arya's. And this one was, she was one of the very, very, we, we were kind of, there just nobody was right, nobody. There were a couple of, a couple of kids who, who felt very actory, who, who felt like they just, you know, they, they've kind of gone through that child actor processing machine that churns out some talented people, but you know, they're good for kind of what child actors are usually cast as, which is roles, you know, that are, that are not as, as adult as this. And just nobody had that, that realness we were looking for. And, and one of the very last faces we saw was was Maisie's face on the cast it is the name of the, the program that you cast with in the window, you know, it's a little window this big. We just saw that face this big. We were like, please be good. Yeah, we, <laughs> we, were, we were on a location scout in Morocco yeah. and we we're at the hotel and had very, very dodgy internet connection. And we're so you can click on the yeah. link for Maisie's audition. You're yeah. waiting. You're watching like the little line. <laughs> and, all we, and we're just seeing this tiny little thumbnail picture of a face that looked so perfect and waiting and waiting and waiting and, and then it was perfect. It was literally 30, 10 seconds into the audition, we were like, yep. yep she's the one. And then we had a chemistry read actually with, um, mm -hmm. with those two, Maisie and Sophie got together and, um, and it was love at first sight. <laughs> Is that where you guys met? Because um, I read a lot about you guys being really great friends. You met at the audition? Yeah, um, uh, I did my first audition that I guess you watched and then um, I did another audition meeting other girls who were playing Sansa. Um, and I got on really, really well with Sophie and just remember her being like super tall and, and <laughs> like after everything we do, she's like, oh, you're really cute. And, <laughs> and then I was a bit like, yeah, I'm only one year younger than you. So. <laughs> but um, yeah, we got on really, really well. And um, I came out of the audition and said to my mom, I was like, even if I don't get the part, I really want that girl to because really cool, so yeah. Oh, you're really cute. <laughs> Still, only one year younger than you. <laughs> Anybody else have an interesting casting story? Well, Jason Momoa came in and of his own free will, after doing his audition, he did the, it's, what's it, the haka? The Maori. The Maori yeah. war dance, which was not written into the, the scene. <laughs> It actually didn't have anything to do with the scene, but it, I would say it impressed us. He did, it. he did the hell out of it. He really did. So that was, yeah, and they, that was another really hard, hard role to, to cast back in the day. Was was uh, was Khal Drogo? And, surprisingly, and you had Peter in mind. Yeah, Peter. Yeah. Actually, before I think even the deal was done with HBO, I sent you an email. I'd met Peter before um, at a dinner or something or other, and. He ignored me, um, <laughs> talked to my wife the whole night. But I remember thinking he is really smart. He's very funny, as you've seen tonight. And, and uh, you know, when we, when we thought we might have a shot to do this, but before we actually had the deal, because the deal took a long time to make, um, I sent him a note. And that you'd already heard about the books and the character, I think. And, and then we met. And do you remember what you said? He had a dem one demand. He had one demand. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, no beards. No beards. No long beards. <laughs> it's done. It's done with the long beards. 
I just never understood why in fantasy dwarves always have beards. <laughs> <laughs> no offense to Mr. Tolkien. But, uh, and, you know, I think I had just done the Narnia movie a couple of years before we met. And, so we had to rewrite the whole script. But, <laughs> yeah. And yet you wear a beard tonight. <laughs> It's not down to my knees. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Some of this the, is, uh, this is the Hollywood beard. <laughs> the fact that the books existed before we began to cast the show, um, and it had so many fans, led to a phenomenon that a, a show that was not based on books would not have. That is, the minute the show was announced, I began to get tapes, <laughs> pictures, links to YouTube performances of the major characters by would-be actors from literally all over the world. And uh, of course, I'm in Santa Fe, New Mexico. I was weighing in on some of the cast of the auditions, but I wasn't in the casting session. I just sent all this stuff on to, on to uh, Dan and David. Uh, here's another one that uh, showed up on YouTube. Some of them weren't half bad, but some of them were frighteningly bad. <laughs> <laughs> And frighteningly inappropriate, uh, <laughs> according to the, the characters as described in the books. But, uh, you know, but, I mean, it's, it's sincere. I don't want to, you know, ridicule it too much. I know there are people out there with dreams and all that, uh, but uh, it's really not the way. You, you can't get cast in a major television show by putting it up on YouTube and asking the fans to campaign for you or or by sending off the fact that you were in a school play and here's a, here's a picture of your performance as Othello or something like that. Uh, well, we're running low on time, but I, I wanted to ask something that I'm sure everybody here it, it really is uh, wondering. Where, um, where are you in the series? How, how, how close are you? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm writing book six, uh, The Winds of Winter. Um, and of course, I'm uh, uh, starting to worry because everybody's asking me, what are you going to do if David and Dan and the show catches up to you, uh, which is beginning to scare me. I didn't think it was a problem before, but uh, they're, they're moving faster than I am. I have, uh, I have not uh, failed to notice this. I, I feel sometimes as if I'm, uh, I'm laying track for a railroad and I can hear the locomotive coming up behind me. <laughs> and it's building speed, and I see the smoke, and I hear the whistle coming, and I better keep laying that track pretty, pretty fast here, because uh, I'll get squashed if the locomotive comes. But I still have a considerable lead, at least that's what I'm telling myself. <laughs> season three is uh, the first, only the first half of book three. So season four will be the second half of book three. And then I have, I have book four and book five. <laughs> Uh, those are gigantic books, which have to be recombined because they're actually parallel. But I'm hoping those will be at least two seasons, maybe three. <laughs> that will get me some time to finish book six, and by the, then by the time they're up, <coughs> they'll be doing that season, and I'll be writing book seven. <laughs> That's my story, and I'm sick of it. <laughs> well, on that note, uh, that's going to conclude our evening, so let's give it up one more time to all the people. Check out Game of Thrones. <laughs>